So both nature and nurture are at work in the development of language competence. But there's also another critical process at work here. Research has shown that every child in every culture goes through some of the same sequences, the same stages of speaking its native language. This universal process suggests that there is also some form of biological maturation at work. As in walking or eating, what a child can do with language at any given time depends on a developmental timetable. This timetable regulates the maturing of the brain and certain muscles in the mouth and throat that are needed for communication. The first stage in acquiring language may be crying. It's our first act of communication. Babies cry because they're hungry, or tired, or cold, or in pain. And the sound they produce usually provokes the desired social response. Other comparable sounds are coos and gurgles, which begin around the second month. The second stage of language development is the babbling of syllable-like sounds. Babbling is important because it allows a baby to practice making sounds, to group them together, and to vary them by adding intonations. At this point, an infant can distinguish sounds of any language and can reproduce them. This ability is called universal adaptability. But by the time a child is one year old, it has lost this flexibility. The child becomes a specialist in its own native language, distinguishing and reproducing only those sounds which are common to that language. Children's first conversations, however, are wordless. They interact with their parents by alternating and coordinating sounds and intonations. And in turn, parents use melodic intonations usually reserved for soothing, arousing, or warning the baby. Intonations that are absent from ordinary adult conversation. Are you being silly? This special kind of speech is known as motherese or parentese. Uh, do you have the feeling that she's communicating with you now already? All and the that time. she's paying attention to you really? <laughs> yeah, and she's that she's listening to your voice? More and more. Anne Fernald of Stanford University has studied this phenomenon in many cultures around the world. Long before infants are speaking a language or understanding a language, they're communicating very actively with their parents. They're understanding their parents. In our research, we're very interested in how this preverbal communication gets established. And what we're doing is recording in cultures around the world the kinds of daily episodes that are very common in the life of an infant. Let's see if we can get a big smile now. So far we've looked at a number of European languages, French, Italian, German, British English, as well as American English. And we've also looked at a Nigerian language called Hausa, as well as at Japanese. What we're finding is that the melodies of mother's and father's speech in these situations are very similar. And we're hypothesizing that it's the melody is the message, that the musical contour of the voice is carrying the meaning to the infant long before language is doing the work. Is that my Becky? <gasps> and babies are not yet attending to words or to linguistic units of information, but they're reading something about the mother's emotions, her intentions, her feelings, through the kinds of melodies that she uses. Oh boy. Oh boy. Can we have a smile from my girl? This device here is uh, an oscilloscope hooked up to uh, a pitch extractor, which will allow us to look at the melodies or the intonation or pitch contours that are used in the mother's voice when she's speaking to a preverbal child. But let me give you a couple of examples. In American English, if you wanted to praise the baby, to let the baby know that you're happy about something that he or she's done, you'd say, good boy, yeah, good up and down, and this is the typical pattern we're finding. So you see the pitch starts low, goes up to a crescendo and down again. In Italian we find a very similar melody, bravissima, bravissima. In German, 
you'd say, Ja schön, toll, gut machst du das. Again, we see here this rise-fall pattern, the melody that goes up and then down again, up and then down again, reaching a very high pitch peak at the top. Uh, we're finding this rise-fall pattern in uh, every European language we've looked at and also uh, in our recent recordings in Japanese. Now, another thing that frequently happens in a baby's life is that the mother says, no, the child's about to head for a, a, a light or a, an electrical outlet where there's some danger possible, or to head over the stairs. And so the mother will say, no, no, stop that, no, using a short, sharp kind of vocalization that's much lower in frequency. In French, it would be, no, no, c'est défendu. Again, short and sharp and staccato in quality. In German, the same sort of thing. Nein, nein, machst du nicht. Short and sharp and not smooth the way the praise contour was. Again, here we're finding universal melodies in Japanese as well as the European languages in the kinds of, of intonation or pitch contours that the mothers are using to convey this message to a baby who does not yet understand the words. That's right. Just calm her down. It's very important that we go beyond this to look at, at other kinds of cultures with very different attitudes toward babies, toward the expression of emotion, uh, in order to really test our hypothesis about universality. After children have practiced the elemental aspects of speech, they're ready for the third stage of language Very development, which comes toward the end of the first year, the one-word stage. Hi. The earliest words are part of a behavioral ritual, such as saying hi or bye. The next set of words are those that express relationships of various kinds. First come relationships between objects and actions, such as saying ball to mean throw it or get it. Then come relationships between objects, fishy. such as saying fishy when pointing to an empty tank where fish once swam. And finally come words that are meant to affect events, such as again or more, when a child wants another push. Again. What is this one? What is that? An airplane. That's an airplane? Mm -hmm. When children learn to use words like ball, or fishy, or again, they're really learning how to use symbols. Words, after all, stand for something else, the objects or actions being described. And symbols can only be used with any degree of proficiency when a number of mental abilities have matured sufficiently, sometime in the second year of life. To use words as symbols, the child's memory must be able to store images or memory codes of events and objects and be able to retrieve them with the appropriate words that symbolize them. At the same time, the child must also understand how to manipulate tools to make things happen. These tools can be people as well as objects. In fact, Parents are the most significant tool the child learns to manipulate to achieve its goals. And language is the most effective way to manipulate them. There it is. Next comes the two-word stage. No matter what their native language, all normal children around the age of a year and a half begin to use two-word phrases to express a number of common functions. Locating and naming things, demanding and desiring things, describing actions and situations, questioning, modifying, and qualifying. A ducky. A ducky. Finally, in the last formal stage of this early development, the telegraphic stage, two-year-olds form simple sentences, mostly of nouns and verbs. The sentences lack plurals, articles, and tenses, but they do maintain the typical word order of actor first, action second, and object last. Thank you.